I'm a, uh, by day, a researcher, but actually my main job, or the way I see it, is as a neurologist. So what I want to do is give you a sense of the perspective uh, from my sort of 10, 15 years as a neurologist, and my particular interest is in neurodegenerative disorders, which I will frame and give you a sense of the context and the global burden. Now what I'm going to do is walk through two or three diseases which will be familiar to all of you, and hopefully try and illustrate to you that in order to deliver for patients what they all want, or at least those that I see all want, which is treatment, that the absolute keystone of that journey is through understanding more about the disease and delivering treatments will require improved access to human tissue material, both normal human tissue, but crucially disease material. So to my eye, the, in a nutshell, if we want to deliver new treatments for disorders that we have no treatment, we need human brains. That's, that's the point that I'd wish to persuade you about. So you'll be familiar with this. Um, so already this is, this is, there was another slide here, but that's fine. You'll be familiar with, with the concept of neurodegenerative disorders and the global health burden. What was on the other slide is the following. If we think about four diseases, so if you think about Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, motor neuron disease, and multiple sclerosis. In the UK, there's about a million people at any given time who suffer with one of those four disorders. So tragically, just about everybody in this room will have some insight into all those diseases, one of those. And what you will all realize is that these, aside from being devastating at the individual level, they have enormous consequences both to the family, to carers, but also to society. And the other thing you will also know um, just from day-to-day -day life, is that the, the, the two features that unify these disorders are that they're progressive, but they're all fatal. And they're fatal because we have no treatments for them. They're all uh, fatal, ranging from three to four years through to 10 to 20 years. So we have these group of disorders, one million plus in the UK, progressive, everybody dies, there are no treatments. That's the current state of play with these disorders. These disorders are increasing in numbers because, as has already been alluded by Colin, by and large they're age-related. We're all living longer, not because of doctors, almost in spite of doctors, but because of public health advances. But the dividend, or the negative dividend, of living longer is more of these disorders which occur as you get older. And this graph illustrates that. Um, I hope you can see that at the back, but the, the graph on the right with the shaded, it just gives you a sense of the global health burden. So one of the major public health threats of our time are neuro, neurodegenerative disorders. You're talking about tens and tens of millions of people globally. So it's a big problem. And the other graph just shows how this, the numbers increase exponentially as you get older. For every five years beyond the age of 65, the prevalence of just Alzheimer's disease doubles. So you can do the arithmetic, and when you get to 80, you can have up to 10 per 100 of the population of 80 having Alzheimer's disease. So if you've got one of these disorders, what do you want? It's, it's simple, it's not rocket science. We've all been patients in some form. All patients want three things. They want treatments that will slow, stop, and ideally reverse the consequence of the disease. I've already told you that there are no treatments for these disorders, that's a statement of fact. So the question is, how do we deliver those? And we'll deliver those by discovery. And discovery requires better understanding of what causes the disease and giving us clues as to how you might slow the disease, stop the disease, and reverse the disease. Again, it's intuitive, but it's correct. If you're dealing with human diseases, you will only ultimately deliver human treatments if you study human material. You can do as many animal experiments and many computer modeling experiments as you wish. They all have a role, but in addition to that, you have to study human material. And given that we're talking about brain disorders, it would be a handy idea to study brains. And that's what this is really about. So let's just <clears throat> develop that by thinking of Parkinson's disease, motor neuron disease, and multiple sclerosis. What I just want to do is give you a very quick um, run through, so, through some of our insights. Parkinson's disease, you, everybody will know about. This bloke, James Parkinson, uh, first identified the concept of the disease back in 1817. But if he was to come back here now, we haven't really moved on that far in the last nearly 200 years from him writing this essay on shaking palsy. But where we have moved on is entirely because of 
pathological studies. What we know, and this is um, the picture you can see here, is that the pathology of this disease has a particular um, signature, if you like, and that signature is defined by location. It's a particular part of the brain, and within that particular part of the brain, it's a particular cell that's lost. So pathologists told us that probably 50, 60 years ago. Then the next major advance, and um, there's only really two advances I'm going to tell you about, because those are the only two that I'm aware of. The next major one was also because of pathology. So this is the idea of molecular pathology. So they basically looked at these brain samples and they wanted to know at a more sophisticated level what's going on. And in 1996 or 97, Maria Spilantini, a, 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 a friend of mine in Cambridge where I've come from, identified the pathological signature of this disease. And there's a particular protein, the name doesn't matter, which occurs in Parkinson's disease. So that's only come through pathologists, nothing else. And so that clue has led now to a whole raft of activity which is about understanding why does that protein form where it does. And then if you understand why it occurs in a bad way, you can then design drugs to stop it occurring. And then you can give that back to patients. So let's think of the next disease. This is an absolutely terrible disorder. It's called motor neuron disease. And the state is also named after this bloke, Lou Gehrig, who's a famous baseball player who died with this disease. The key point I'd wish to make about this disease is just how devastating it is. This disease, 50% of patients from the point of diagnosis are dead within 18 to 24 months. Terrible, terrible disorder. It's essentially um, defined by loss of voluntary muscles. So people get paralyzed, lose the ability to speak, and then other muscles, your breathing muscles and your eating muscles. So you can imagine the consequence of that. By and large, your brain is was believed to be intact, and people thought this was just a problem of the nerves that supply the muscles. But actually, there's also a problem going on in the brain and your thinking as well. So we've known about this disease for donkey's years, which is about 100, 200 years. But it's only recently that we've begin, begun to get better insight into the cause. So we've had the observation, and the, and the observation is this. So the, the big slide on the left, or the big image on the left, gives rise to the other name of this disease, which is called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. But that basically defines that this is a problem of loss of muscles in the lateral part of the spinal cord, and sclerosis is just a fancy name for scarring. But then on this bit of the slide, and now this is just four years ago, a bunch of pathologists again, we're always coming back to pathologists, discovered that the signature of this disease is this those brown blobs. So this is another protein which, which forms abnormal inclusions, and that is the pathological signature of this disease. It's called TDP43, and that's kicked off a huge raft of activity, and the prediction is it is the understanding of why that protein goes to the abnormal place, understanding why that occurs will be key to how you might treat these patients. Last disease I'm going to tell you about, which I have to tell you about in Scotland, is because it's this disease, MS. It's a very Scottish disease, um, which, is a, which isn't really something that Scotland wants to be famous for, but it is. There's more MS per capita in Scotland than there is in the rest of the world. Reasons why is another debate. The point about this disease, there's a lot of it about, particularly in Scotland, it affects uh, often younger people. It's the exception that proves the rule of age-related uh, disease causation, but I'm using it really to highlight again the importance of pathology. So for a long time, pathologists have known that the defining feature of this disease is what you can see highlighted by the black arrow. So basically, the insulation of your nerves in your brain are lost in this disease, and blue becomes white. So that was the original pathological observations, and that's got a 50 to 100 year pedigree. But I don't want to just give you a bleak, negative story. Pathology is not just about observing how brains die. It's also about giving us clues as to how you might fix the brain. So what we've learned in the last 10 years, that in patients with MS, not only do they have those white blobs, they also have that blob within the, um, the ring of red. And that is an area which was once white, but has now become pale blue. It's an example where the brain has repaired itself. So this is an example of hope that comes through pathological studies. 
So it shows that the human brain, again, this has nothing to do with doctors, I'd argue it's in spite of doctors, the brains of MS patients can repair. And that's what I'm showing you there. And we only know that because of pathological studies. Now, of course, the question is how? And then again, pathologists have helped us out here. So this is now 2002. People have shown that those brains where there's the repair occurring in MS, they have this thing called stem cells in, in the brain. Now, you can't go very far these days without hearing about stem cells, and that's what I try and do. I'm not going to talk about that today, but here's another example. We know that the human brain has stem cells, very recent discovery. So putting that all together, what I've hopefully tried to do is tell you that if you want to develop new treatments, which is what everybody wants, and incidentally, those people who felt that brain research is important but didn't feel able that, that it may not be quite right for themselves, I understand that position, and there's an ambiguity about families members, but there's absolutely no ambiguity by and large from a clinical perspective when you're seeing patients that every patient wants therapies, they want help, they want the delivery of something meaningful. So they want treatments that if, if you can't stop the disease, which is a big ask, they certainly want treatments that will hopefully slow the disease. And what I hope I've um, shown you is the key to that is understanding more about this and the key to that discovery process is tissue banking and brain banking. Thanks very much.